of mine who works at OneSecure, and he's going to talk to you about LDAP. Hi. Um, just to give you a background about me, some of you uh, may know me as XS. You can call me Greg, whichever you want. Um, I work with Pete at a uh, security vendor of sorts in the uh, Bay Area. I'm a security engineer over there, so I don't really work with LDAP every day. Uh, a little bit of my background with LDAP is uh, when I was first brought on board, I was asked to implement a new uh, mail and user system. And uh, I was looking at a couple different options, either like a SQL backend or a virtual user backend. And um, I'd kept, I kept hearing things about LDAP, and I, I'd never used it before. So, so I figured, eh, let's see what I could use it for. And it turns out my uh, favorite MTA, QMail, has a patch for it uh, called QMail LDAP, which lets you use a LDAP backend for user authentication, aliasing, etc. Uh, that's pretty much how I picked it up. Unfortunately, the, uh, the project I was working on was kind of canceled. So I haven't had much uh, other implementation work with LDAP aside from that. So that's about where my knowledge ends. But what I've done is I've tried to look, get as much research on LDAP as I can find in you know, RFCs and associated facts and online documentation so that um, those of you who haven't heard of LDAP or X500 or any directory access protocol can walk away from this at least knowing what it is, knowing what you could do with it, and uh, hopefully wanting to go back and learn some more. Um, I did have some pretty slides and such for you, but uh, seeing as I can't get internet access, we're going to go with text and e-terms. So uh, you'll have to look at my ASCII diagrams. Uh, so with that, feel free to ask me questions anytime. Just let me get through this spleel I wrote in a paper, and uh, then you can just hammer me away. I have no intention of this being long-winded or taking all day or anything. So, um, you know, as, as soon as you feel like you don't have any more questions, just get the hell out of here. Uh, if you have any LDAP3 questions, uh, there's someone else in the room that can help you out a little more with that. But we'll get into that in a little while. Uh, LDAP, Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. It's an open standard alternative to X500 Directory Access Protocol. X500 is a directory access protocol first approved as a standard in 1988, was maintained by the ITU, uh, International Telecommunications Union, which released an enhanced version in 93. Uh, X500 uses the OSI network stack instead of TCP, IP, U UDP, etc. Uh, not many of us use that anymore. A directory, for those of you who don't know what directories are, directory is an the, the intent of the directory was based on the fact that human users must be able to look up assorted information about other people. Email addresses, mailing addresses, telephone numbers, fax numbers, birth dates, spoken languages, etc. And computers need to be able to look up addresses for various services. Uh, passwords for users, uh, user IDs, permissions, file system information, mount points, remote hosts, etc. Um, and a lot of the time you think, why not just use a centralized database for all this information? And the problem comes in with, because most centralized databases are big enough and comprehensive enough to, to cause slowdowns during peak query times. Um, and because of their centralization, they're usually isolated on very inefficient high availability networks, or the, the simplest thing could just make them unavailable to any other networks. Um, more on that, the administration of these databases is usually also centralized. Often, this means that there's a long turnaround time between when you want changes done and when changes are done, uh, often called passing the buck. There's another similar way of, of distributing this information, and it's DNS, Domain Name Service. Um, DNS is maintained in a distributed fashion, like LDAP where uh, each DNS server provides name servers for a limited number of domains. And uh, along with that, servers are often identified, uh, backup servers are often identified for domains so that uh, in case of failure of a primary server, uh, hosts won't lose name service. Simple enough. Uh, there's some problems with DNS, though. DNS has very limited search capabilities, and uh, the fact that it provides, it, it provides very few data types uh, Data types in A records, 
PTR records, C names, different types of uh, records you can associate with the actual names you're hosting. Uh, and adding new names involves widespread uh, implementation changes. You know, I can't just go out tomorrow and create a new uh, record type and expect everyone else to be able to read it without everyone else changing what their name server does. Um, solution to this, LDAP provides decentralized maintenance, meaning that each site running LDAP is responsible for its part of the directory so that maintenance and updates can be easy, done instantaneously and easy. You know, if I want to make a change to my local company's database, I don't have to go, you know, I don't have to call, I don't know, Washington to get them to change the database and then wait for the changes to sync all the way back to me. I make it locally, they see it over there, as easy as that. Um, it has extremely powerful searching capabilities. Um, not exactly all regular expression style, but very similar. Uh, and you can construct just extremely complex queries uh, to search LDAP databases. Or excuse me, not databases, directories is the correct term. Uh, the definition of how it stores data is actually stored inside of it. So if you want to make a change to how it stores data, say um, you want to add a new type of record, uh, favorite topping on pizza, you don't have to go out and change the actual implementation. You just add it to your directory. And people remotely can't see it unless they add it to their directory. And it doesn't affect them and it doesn't affect you because they can't see it. It's just something you've added to your database. They can sync it up to theirs, you can sync it up to theirs, whichever. Um, as it's standard based, it's very, very, very easy to build applications which use directory uh, service. Uh, email servers, automated resource locators, uh, other special purpose tools. Uh, regardless of where they are, what they're running on, or what, what they're running for an LDAP implementation. Um, also, because it's standard-based, there are few incompatibilities between different, different implementations. Once you start using it, you'll see that's a little wrong, but because it's, it's based on a standard, they're supposed to be all the same, but you know, one has an API that allows you to do this, a different one has an API that allows you to do that. So it gets confusing when you start running software for it. Um, and it can be accessed by mo most information in one implementation can be accessed from another implementation without much headache, uh, most of the time. Problems with LDAP. Oh, start over, excuse me. Uh, searches. Searches in LDAP can span more than one LDAP server, meaning that they're going to have to cross network boundaries. And uh, a lot of implementations cache all this information that, that it goes out and requests from a remote server. And this usually slows down the response time uh, in queries. It's not as true anymore uh, with people getting larger and larger servers and you know more and more bandwidth. But um, the, that was one of the slowdowns and why you haven't seen LDAP deployed everywhere yet. Um, security configurations are another uh, problem with LDAP. Uh, a lot of the security configurations allow a limited number of query returns when you uh, query LDAP. Uh, you may seek you know, something like everyone named Bob and you may get 100 results, uh, but the security restrictions on the server may only restrict you to seeing 10 results. Uh, these are all stuff that can be tweaked, but it requires a lot of work on the user end if it's not set up correctly to begin with. Um, some examples of directory service, in case you still haven't caught on, uh, phone companies 401 or directory service, uh, or excuse me, directory assistance. Um, it's provided by all the baby bells or all the ILEX and all the CLEX. Um, they keep an electronic list of all the the, you, you know, everyone has a phone line, their names, their addresses, their phone number. Um, you call up, give them the name, give them the address, they give you the phone number. Um, it's also available in the phone book. The problem with that is, if, uh, if you, you, you need the city they live in, excuse me, it's hot as hell in here, uh, and their name. Now, if you return more than one name, say two names, there's really no other way to limit down who's who. It's a limit of the, an example of another directory service. Um, in addition, the information they may have in there could be from two weeks old in the electronic version to up to a year old in the phone book. So, 
Not much they could do about a phone book that's sitting in your house other than sending you another phone book. Pretty inefficient. Um, another problem with that is if I want to look up the number of someone in Atlanta, for example, I have to call a directory service in Atlanta. I can't call my local directory service. So another limitation of this uh, directory service, or excuse me, directory assistance. Um, how directories are broken up. Uh, entries are primarily constructed holding information in a directory. An entry would be a entry for a user, for example, or a person. Uh, each entry contains information about an object. An object would be telephone number, favorite topping on pizza, uh, spoken language, mailing address, email address. Those are examples of objects in LDAP. Um, uh, each of these has a collection of attributes for them, or uh, syntax for attributes for them. Uh, for example, a telephone number can only contain numerics. Uh, your surname can only contain, contain alphanumeric characters. Um, there's some other ones that, you know, photo data, time code, different types of syntax you can stick on attributes. Boring stuff. Um, security in LDAP. LDAP by default is extremely lax when it comes to security. It's not much more secure than any default installation of your favorite OS. Pick whatever it is, excluding Windows, because that's never secure. Um, securing it requires much administrative intervention. So it's not something you could plug and play and hope no one owns it. Um, access control lists are built into LDAP. Uh, you just have to, have to know how to use them, and you have to use them. Um, each attribute or each uh, object of a given entry, entry being a person, for example, can be permitted to uh, detect, compare, read, modify permissions based on the reader's membership in various groups. For example, if uh, someone wanted to look me up and uh, get my phone number, my LDAP server can restrict them from seeing my phone number. They could see that I exist. They could compare my password against another password if I allow them to do that. Uh, they could get my address, but I could restrict them from seeing my phone number. Or it could be the other way around. I could let them only see my phone number and see that I exist. Um, so that's what, they, what's, that's what I mean when I say compare, read, and modify. Compare would be just compare two entries. Uh, does he, you know, is Greg in the LDAP database? Yes, Greg's in the LDAP database, for example. Um, you can also specify information given to the public so that anyone can read it the same way, um, you know, if I just want them to have my phone number. Uh, a pretty cool security feature of LDAP is when, if you're using it for user authentication, is the uh, user password object, which stores user passwords, of course, duh. Uh, Syntax allows you to store it in plain text. Unix crept, MD5, SHA, and seeded MD5 or SHA, which is pretty cool considering. Um, say I'm running a free BSD machine, and I, um, I want to authenticate my Linux users off of it, and I'm running LDAP for authentication. I can use any of these schemes, SHA, MD5, Unix crypt, and it doesn't matter what platform I'm using. It's all based in LDAP. Um, so I could go from Sys5 to BSD without having to worry about going between MD5 and crypt. Um, some common uses of LDAP. Email servers. Not all MTAs, but as far as I know, most MTAs have either patches or come default with support for LDAP that allows uh, control of addressing, aliasing, forwarding. Uh, and another example of this is QML LDAP. Um, uses user it uses LDAP to look up user information and then uses the return information to process messages. Um, this saves having to add, you know, 100 users to a mail server just to get them to receive mail. You stick them in the LDAP database, and you're set. You don't have to add anyone to the machine. Kind of like virtual users with, with any other MTA, except you're doing yourself a favor by putting them in LDAP. Um, the patch for QMail that I was referring to earlier will also do authentication for, you know, if you want to pop in and get your mail, or IMAP in and get your mail. Um, you can use the authentication scheme in LDAP on a variety of platforms, uh, usually using LDAP as the transport, but there's also uh, PAM LDAP modules. So if you uh, 
I don't know, Solaris comes with PAM support. If you wanted your Solaris machine to th start authenticating off an LDAP server, you would just stick a PAM LDAP module on there, and you're set. Or your Red Hat machine, or you know whatever you have PAM compiled on. Um, employee listing and automation is another use for it. Um, very similar to what Netscape uses. Netscape's, well, last time I read, Netscape's uh, corporate network was based on LDAP. Which basically meant HR hires a person, they add them to the database, and instantly they're on the contact list, on the phone list, in the mail server. You know, they have an account to dial up and do whatever, uh, all just by adding one entry. So that's, the, that's where the centralization comes in. But it's not limited by centralization. I'll get to that. Um, LDAP can be used as an NIS replacement, which I'm very happy about. Uh, there's some plugin replacements, which are written by uh, the guys at paddle.com, P-A-D-L.com. Uh, one of their products is called YPLDAPD. And what it basically does is, if you say you have an existing NIS server, and you want to replace it with an LDAP server, but uh, you have machines on the network that don't support LDAP. Uh, you can stick YPLDAPD on there to answer NIS queries from the LDAP database. Um, that way you can start sticking access lists on there and use the LDAP database for other, other things on your network. Um, pretty easy to implement too, I've done it a couple of times. They make another software product. Uh, these are all free products by the way. I don't recall what the name is, it's available from the same people. And what it does is it acts as a uh, object uh, that you stick in. It's in Solaris. It's lib security, user lib security. Uh, it's a YP object that you stick in there that instead of going to an uh, NIS server, it will just automatically go to an LDAP server, save you tons of trouble. Um, and with an infrastructure like this, it's pretty easy to roll it out network-wide without anything hip hiccuping or anyone dying, coming in the office with a gun and killing you or anything. Um, and it allows for replication uh, and authentication across your network. Uh, I'm going to throw out a few examples of some software and some products that use LDAP. Um, Netscape's got a really nice LDAP server. It's uh, called iPlanet Directory Server now. Uh, there's some... Uh, most Cisco hardware nowadays supports LDAP. Uh, Bay Network sells some stuff that supports LDAP. Uh, just, it's, it's rolling out at a very fast rate. Um, that was the paper I've written. I hope, hope it's answered some of the questions you have. I also have some diagrams uh, I'll show you. Maybe this will help you out if you don't understand yet. But if you guys have any questions, just start firing away. Uh, hit me. Uh, what's a good open source LDAP? Open LDAP. Uh, that's all I've used. I swear by it. It's free. Uh, be careful with the documentation. It's uh, you got to look through their fax system. They have one of those automated fax systems. It gets a little confusing at times, but uh, all in all, it's a pretty hardcore server. Um, I've used it on a variety of platforms: Linux, FreeBSD, Solaris. Um, so that's my favorite. They're at openldap.org. How many uh, directory servers communicate with each other or how do they authenticate with each other? Uh, the, if you're spanning more than one directory server, I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, Lito, you want to you wants to know how the uh, how servers, if they're spanning a network, authenticate against each other. So it doesn't think that it's just a user going out and trying to pull information. Nito knows a little bit more about LDAP 3 than I do. There you go. Safe pages? Is it based off uh, U, U Michigan? Yes. Okay. Hmm. 
Uh, that reminds me, another open one, uh, University of Michigan. Let me give you the URL for that, because it's kind of convoluted. Yay. Uh, nope. Uh, I'll pull that up for you. Any other questions? Go ahead. Can you run regular NIST services and, and LF services on the same machine and grab it and migrate? Uh, <clears throat> I wouldn't. Well, if I were rolling it out, I would have two separate machines simply for uh, to minimize the confusion involved. Uh, you could. Uh, it, you know, you know, it's it's not going to hurt anything. It's just a matter of uh, maintenance versus confusion. Um, the uh, the YP or NIS uh, LDAP implementations are pretty easy to set up. Uh, once they're set up, it's all a matter of maintaining the LDAP server. Um, try not. What's up? I don't make some called migration tools that say XC password, XC shadow, root, all your mail points, and all on the fly add it to your LDAP directory or add it with LDAP add and LDAP. So let's say you want to have an NIS, it'll be the NIS flat file that will create an LDAP, which is the LDAP format that you can or to use like LDAP add. P-A, oh, excuse me, I spelled that wrong. Dyslexia sets in. Any other questions? Go, dude. Use LDAP. Well, you did out add the uh, the root DN first. The when you're adding it the first time, or where it is in the the slapd config. Okay. You have to add. You actually have to add the root DN first. Oh. That I, I, it's not documented, and you know it may not be something you always have to do. But I've always had to do that. You have to add the root DN. Yeah. You, you do the same thing when you're adding a user. You just add the, the actual six. So, uh, like if your uh, if your organization equals DefCon, you know, and uh, your country equals US, you add that first, and then add users underneath that. Oh, you, you need to use that for the authentication. Hmm. Catch me later. We'll take a look at it on here. In the LDAP, or for LDAP or prior to LDAP? The RFCs. Uh, let me show you the RFCs here. There's a couple of them. These are the RFCs you want. Oops. Right there. Um, a lot of the earlier ones in here are X500 RFCs. The later ones are LDAP3 RFCs. Um, but everything in between is will help you organize it. You'll see how other people have done it. Another good example is if you look at some of the uh, facts on these pages here and see how they've laid it out. Uh, it's a good good indication on how to do it. It's pretty straightforward. Um, when you add users, you know, you add them as people. When you add computers, you add them as computers. Uh, it's pretty tough to, to, to confuse yourself when you do it, uh, except with the number of options you have, the number of objects you have. Um, can you think of any anything you've used, Lito? Uh, it's probably a good start. Uh, there was one I was using for a while. Uh, there's Net LDAP. There's another one. It's a simple LDAP administration tool. It's S L A 
Sí. Check out FreshMeet also. Do a search for uh, LDAP. There's quite a few front ends. Uh, that's another problem, actually, with some of the open uh, or free LDAP servers, is that they don't come with a front end. So you, you're going to have to do it all by hand, unless you go out and either write a front end or download a front end. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, the advantage of the commercial servers versus the free servers. You have a, a front end to do everything in. I, I haven't uh, implemented that before. What's the communication protocol between the LDAP server? It's uh, Slurp. D, it uses Slurp D. I'm not sure what port it runs on. Um, but you run a replication server. Oh, no, actually, not if you're replicating. If you're just running flat LDAP between servers, it's still LDAP. It just goes out as a user. That's what we were discussing before, how it authenticates. Yeah, it's um, X500, which was the predecessor to LDAP, ran on the OSI network stack. Uh, LDAP runs on TCP IP. Uh, let me see what port it is for you here. Yeah, that's SSL LDAP. Uh, I don't recall which port it runs on. 389? There you go, 389. Yeah. What's the most common version of LDAP that's used in most corporations? That's the LDAP 3 master over there. Uh, yeah. Most of the, uh, well, you've got, okay, there's a couple of examples of LDAP ripoffs or similarities. Notes uses, uh, I think, X400, X500 uh, for the back end. Uh, Active Directory from Microsoft, similar to LDAP. Uh, NDS from Novell, similar to LDAP. Um, we were actually talking one day about uh, using an Active Directory server for an LDAP backend with the NIS pl uh, module for Solaris to use a 2000 machine to authenticate a Solaris machine. But, uh, we never got around to that. Would have been kind of cool. Well, I know that was the yeah, uh, the U Michigan URL is right here. LDAP ITD U Mich. Uh, Open LDAP is based off of that, and there's a little more. There's more developers on the Open LDAP team. Uh, I would stand behind them more. The Open LDAP team myself. That's exactly how it works. That's exactly how it works. It's so where they don't need to specify server, they can specify Yeah. Uh, it's just on the server that you're querying, it needs to have other servers defined. It needs to know where to look for these, the other objects that you want to that you want to grab. It's not as bad anymore. Um, if you're you know running huge huge queries, you're going to see slowdowns. But you know everyone's running their LDAP servers in like 450s and crap, so you're not going to have a problem. Well, uh, Courier IMAP, which uh, Inter7 is now maintaining, will support LDAP for authentication. So I had all the user's information stored in LDAP. Yeah. Someone back there had a question. <coughs> It, uh, Sleepy Cat is what they they roll out with and they suggest that you use. Um, that's all I've ever used. Is Sleepy Cat DB, sure, Sleepy Cat Berkeley DB. Excuse me. Netscape, corporate. Four one one dot com.
the, the security of it versus Active Directory or NDS? I don't even know. Yeah, it was just an assumption. Um, security is passing clear text by default. So you'd want to use, you know, uh, LDAP SSL. And since you're authenticating off an Active Directory server, again, if not that we know that it's possible or not, uh, you don't have SSL support. Um, it's all in the. It's all in transport. It's not that much different from using Radius, except that Radius hashes everything before it sends it. Um, so it'd be, you know, it'd be this. What's actually on your network that you need to worry about? Uh, as far as the machine, the access lists are what you want to set up to allow people on your network to either, you know, just compare passwords, just get usernames, user IDs. Mm -hmm. I haven't done that, so I can't. I can't really comment on whether on what you could do with it. I'm sorry, dude. I can't hear you. Oh, a lot of bugs in LDAP. Uh, yeah, documentation. The first bug. Um, Lack of any knowledge amongst uh, network administrators about LDAP. Um, most of the bugs are just user created. Just lack of knowledge or no one's ever used it before. Um, that or confusion. It's, you know, once you, if you set, when you set up for the first time, you're going to be really frustrated, just like anything else. And the first time I set it up, I'm like, what the fuck? Just use SQL or something. But after a while, I realized, okay, I, I see where this fits in. Um, I haven't run into any major bugs. That's easy though, because you dump it to an LDIF, pull out what you don't want, and then dump it back in. I mean, I would, you'd think. Uh, that's, that's a way I found to fix the database a lot of times. Just dump it to an LDIF, pull out what you want, and then dump it back. Anyone else? Uh, he was talking about corruption in, in databases. Yeah, I have problems when you're setting up the replication, the instruction does not work at all, and I just dump it to LDIF and put it back. Yeah. LDIF is the, uh, it just dumps, see the format I have here on the command line? Uh, it just basically dumps the database back to that format out of the, the DB format. Uh, so you can go in there and modify it or replicate it, back it up, show it to your friends, tattoo it on your back or something. Not very. Out of the box. Well, the, the problem you're going to run into is if it's on your DMZ and someone knows it's there, they're going to be able to query it for certain user information. Um, but if you have it on the DMZ specifically for a few machines on the DMZ, you can have it uh, host simply what it needs. You can have it host the portion of the, the directory that it needs. So uh, if I don't know, say you have a, have a list of all your clients for your web servers in the LDAP server, you can have the one on the DMZ hold only that and have it replicate or uh, work with an internal LDAP server. Use ACL also. Yeah. You can make it so that the user is the only person that can see their own password. So when the user can see their name and their whatever, I haven't used TACAX before. Uh, actually, I have to, as soon as I get back, I think, play with TACAX. Um, LDAP versus Radius, 
I was bored a long time ago, and uh, I wrote a QML backend in Perl that used Radius for uh, authentication and user information. And it's uh, pretty convoluted to use Radius to store real names, forwarding addresses, uh, mailboxes, pictures of people, what languages they speak. Um, I think it should stick only to doing authentication, you know, with Radius. Authentication and pulling down, you know, network information, not RAS and NAS information. Um, Okay, authentication, you have the benefit with Radius because more stuff supports it right now. Um, well, there's a way to, uh, there's some where you can on the LDAP. Let's get into that. Uh, authentication, accounting is what was one of the ones you mentioned. Um, and authorization. Authorization you're going to win with LDAP every time. Uh, you could say, you know, you can... If, if you're running the L NIS backend with LDAP, you can have it do everything on your machine. So you're going to have the benefit there. Um, and it can be distributed too. You know, ra oh, Radius, you can do uh, the whole, what is it called, uh, realms with Radius. But you're still limited to the authentication. You can't store as much as many objects in Radius. Uh, so authentication, you're probably going to win with Radius if that's all you want to do. That that answer your question convoluted enough? Or you can flag me down later and hit me or something. Anyone else? Did I bore you to death enough? Okay. Um, my you can I'll have slides for you which weren't here today. Uh, you can get them here. I'm gonna write down the URL. Um, or you can email me. It's my email address. Always around, always available. If you see me here at Kinds, just run up to me, ask me a question, whatever. I'll either uh, avoid the question or deny it. Um, that's been LDAP. That's what I know. That's what you know now. Hope you enjoyed it.